Perfect. Um, so welcome everybody. And um, we are here today to talk about aviation as the um, special career industry that we are talking about in our series. We do have a bunch of other ones coming up as well. Um, but today we're focusing on aviation. We have an amazing lineup of individuals and I will introduce each one individually. They're going to share some information with you, including how they got into their particular field. Um, and also any tips and uh, insight into that particular field, anything to keep in mind, their personal experiences, and um, anything else that, that they really can think of. For starters, we are, uh, going to start. Oh, uh, before we get started, if you guys have any questions for our panelists, we are going to be answering or they are going to be answering questions at the end. So go ahead and type any questions you have in the chat along the way. If it's a, for a specific panelist, you can include who it's for or if you just want to ask all of them, you can just put the question in general in there. Uh, but we will get to your questions at the end. Um, all right. So first, we're going to start with Nicole Tucker. Um, after receiving a degree in cultural anthropology from the University of California at Santa Barbara, Nicole became a flight attendant for American Airlines. Over the past nine years, aviation has afforded her the opportunity to travel the world, experience different cultures, and to work alongside the Federal Aviation Administration. This career has dictated changes in her personal life as well. Through connections made in this career, she was able to reside and work on a wild American Mustang horse farm for the past four years. That is exciting. The farm works in conjunction with the Mustang Heritage Foundation nonprofit to train and adopt out wild American Mustangs. With a career in aviation, she's been able to experience firsthand that the sky is, in fact, the limits. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nikki. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm a flight attendant for American Airlines, and like Bree said, um, after I graduated from Santa Barbara, it was the recession. <laughs> so nobody in Los Angeles was hiring at all whatsoever. Um, I was waitressing, just trying to pay the bills, and um, <clears throat> went back for nursing prerequisites at one point and finished that up, was ready to go to nursing school, and they started hiring for flight attending. So uh, I went for that. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit about the, the fundamentals of the job itself. And then I'll go into more, a little bit more personal stuff, if that works. So let me try, uh-oh, hang on one moment. I'm having a little, oh, geez. Okay, I just have to open this, I apologize. Is that up or is it not up? Not yet. Okay, sorry. Here we go, it should be up soon. Give me a moment. I do apologize. I practiced this. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me share screen. I think I got it. There we go. Share. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so flight attendant career. Um, what you need to be a flight attendant, what they're looking for when you go for the interview process, first and foremost, is customer service experience. They do suggest two years of college, but if you have more customer service experience, especially in the corporate world, um, they'll accept that. Mobility, so uh, you're gonna have to be able to move to a certain base or at least commute there. Um, ability to handle stressful situations calmly, critical thinking and problem solving, and comfortable with potential safety, security, and medical situations, all of which <clears throat> you will definitely face almost daily on every flight that you're on. So basically it's being a MacGyver. And I know some of you are really young, probably don't know what that means. You should look up MacGyver. It's basically jerry-rigging whatever situation you have in the moment and figuring it out. So there's that. Uh, the biggest thing personally for it is independence and adaptability. I know with pilots as well, this is something 
you're by yourself. You're with a crew, but sometimes that crew is not great. <laughs> and sometimes they want to do their own thing. So you are independent. And what I mean by that is you're walking down the streets of Paris and have the loneliest dinner of your life, which is Walker's shortbread and Chimay. And then bed picnics. This right here is what we call in the industry bed picnics, which happens probably more than I'd like to admit. And lots of selfies, like by yourself in front of the Eiffel Tower. So that independence can be kind of like, it's good to have independence. And I'm very independent as a person, but if it does get lonely, and that's just the reality of it. There are ways to counter that, but that's just the honest truth. Um, Cause I know a lot of the new hires that have come out that are a little younger, they get lonely more often than someone of my age. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna just describe the schedule for overall for American Airlines <clears throat> and this middle. Very appropriate picture. For your yeah, family. this picture, me trying to explain my work schedule to my friends. This is what it looks like, but here it is. So you're, when you're junior, you are on what they call reserve. And that means that you are on call for the company 18 days out of the month. So you get free and clear 12 days off a month, but you're on call for them. 12 hour shifts in the day, and then you have 12 hours off. But in those 12 hours, you have to be ready within two hours and at the airport. It's for people who call off and things like that. You're the reserve. And you get paid a 75 hour guarantee <clears throat> if you fly or if you don't fly. That's what you get. If you fly more than that, then you get more than that. And you can also pick up on your days off and get more hours than that as well. Then the more senior you get is a line holder. And uh, between two and five years, you have one month on, one month off, like one month reserve line. And then it goes to three months or three months line holder, one month off. And as a line holder, you have to fly minimum 40 hours per month to maintain all your benefits. Uh, you have a hugely flexible schedule. You can fly whatever, kind of whatever you want within your seniority range and move things around. Uh, but there is no guarantee. So you do have to work for your hours. And um, that can be a bummer sometimes, because sometimes if you live in base and you get 75 hour guarantee, you can kind of ride it out and have some days off at home. So there's that. And then the pay scale and benefits. Um, it is full 401k medical dental and then vacation that you increase as you go through years. Um, free flights for yourself, a spouse and children and then taxes only for your own parents. And if you're not married, you can have a registered companion, friend or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Uh, and then eight round trip buddy passes for the year for friends and family. And then the pay is a little bit like the scheduling. So this is the pay scale per year. That's flight hours only. And then on top of that, so that 75 hours would be flight hours. Um, and then you get per diem the entire time you're away from base. Two dollars and ten uh, cents an hour. That is tax free for the most part. So that's on top of your base pay. So your first year out, it doesn't sound like a lot. You're looking at about three thousand dollars a month. Now you can pick up more. And then there's little caveats to what positions you work on the plane. You can get three dollars an hour more, up to ten dollars an hour more, depending. And so per flight hour. So that's kind of the overall what you're looking at now with this job. You also get 12 days off a month that first year and even more. So you're getting paid for what you work kind of, um, you don't work a 40 hour work week. It's monthly hours and um, you just make it work. And then of course the number one benefit is travel. So these are all just pictures of my travels all over, um, Thailand, Africa, Phoenix, uh, Las Vegas. I mean, you get to go everywhere. <laughs> so that is of course, the main reason people have this job in particular. The benefits are very, very good. The travel benefits are phenomenal. Family and friends get to travel as well. There's my mom and dad in Rome. Uh, my niece got to come to Italy. And so like my nieces and nephews get to travel on my little buddy passes. And that's my uncle right here. He was actually on a flight that I was working home like to go visit my family and I had no idea he was gonna be on my flight. So that happens a lot too. It makes the world a lot of a smaller place. Um, so yeah, the sky's the limit with this job. 
that's Africa, Thailand, Crater Lake, Oregon, and New York, and me in the middle, because um, everybody has to have an engine picture. And so um, that's kind of the overall, like the heart of the job and the description of the, you know, the, the basics of things you might want to know. And then everybody has been, we've kind of been discussing it about the pandemic thoughts. It says here, we're in this together, all the airlines. We're taking a very big hit right now, all of us. Um, obviously we're wearing masks and this is a cleaner lady from Albania that I talked to in Boston and she was just, we're all in it together. This is just kind of a really sad, hard deal right now. Um, and the next few years are going to wane for, and we, I probably will honestly be furloughed come September 30th, but we have contracts that allow them to call us back as they rebuild the airline. And a lot of um, flight attendants and pilots have already been through this with 9-11 and, and the recession and things like that. So the truth is that while right now it's shaky because of what's happening, um, down the line, they are going to rehire. It always has an ebb and flow, and they will always call people back and rehire. And so it's an always kind of a flowing option for this job. Um, I think that might be it. Oh, uh, there are some really cool opportunities in this job. I'll go back to this one because that other one was a little sad. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of opportunities where you can work with the, alongside the FAA. I did a special project for the FAA recertifying um, our one of our air, airplanes when we were going through a merger. Um, you can work with the company side if you're sick of flying. Honestly, they allow you to step into other roles like teaching roles of other flight attendants, or um, if you're in if your degree was in marketing or business or something like that, you're allowed, they have opportunities for you to go work on the company side, maintain your status as a flight attendant. So you still go keep your, your qualifications current and then you're able to go and be, at, be in your base or be at home for a little bit doing the work with them um, if you live in base where they're needing the work. But um, so that's kind of a neat thing here. It's not necessarily like flight attending Obviously, seniority, you move up, but there are lateral moves within the company that you can do just if you get a little bit overwhelmed with too much flying. You can be a supervisor. There's just a lot of movement in there. Um, yeah, uh, the biggest thing is, like I said at the beginning, being able to be good with people because you have about 600 people a day through your hands and greeting them and serving them. And so you just learn to basically have boundaries for your own, like personal stuff can't get involved. You have to be very professional and um, be able to handle these things and put things on kind of compartmentalize and shelf things as you um, encounter different people and problems and things like that. So I think that's it. Any other questions, Bree? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was muted. Um, not at the moment, but at the end, we're going to see if the panelists, uh, sorry, if uh, participants have any questions for the panelists. Okay. I think that's touched what I was going to touch on. Good. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, wow, that schedule. <laughs> That was very interesting, and I only caught on to about half of it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But um, I understand that. You know, I pop in yeah, and see um, Brie when I can, just kind of pop in and out. That's how it works. <laughs> see little glimpses. Yeah, but you said it like flexibility is key. Um, <clears throat> and adaptability and those people skills. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, we are going to move to our second panelist. So we have Sydney Feruzzi next. Uh, Sydney attended Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach and graduated with a BS in aeronautical science in 1997. She spent two and a half years as a flight instructor before she got her first airline job. Um, as a first officer on the Embraer, am I saying that right? Embraer 120. Yeah. 
uh, at Great Lakes Aviation in 2000. From there, she went to Atlantic Southeast Airlines in 2001. She upgraded to captain in 2006. And while at ASA, she flew the Embraer 120 and CRJ 200 as a first officer, as well as the ATR 72 and the CRJ 200 slash 700 slash 900 as a captain. In 2016, she was hired as a first officer at, uh, sorry, Elegant, Ale yeah. Elegant Air. Yeah, which is called Alley Giant. Ali Giant. Oh, Ali Giant. oh sorry. <laughs> it's like so, I need the font to be a little bigger. Um, Ali Giant Air, where she currently flies the Airbus 320. She has approximately 12,000 hours flying time and 7,000 hours as pilot in command. Wow. Uh, we are going to go ahead and let you talk now, Sydney. Hello. Um, thanks for the great info there. A little bit of what I see is probably going to be redundant because I didn't realize you're going to reading the whole thing, but that's okay. Um, Nicole gave a great overview of what the scheduling and pretty much how the industry goes. For me, I want to just talk more about what it means to be an airline pilot and how you become one. Um, as Brianna said, uh, I work for Allegiant Air. We're, uh, we're one of those low-cost carriers. We have a base in Mesa, Arizona, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and several others across the East Coast. Uh, as she said, I've been a pilot since 1994, and I've flown for an airline since 2000. I have over 12,000 hours, 7,000 of that as a captain. I have an FAA airline transport pilot rating with type ratings in ATR-72, CL-65, which is a regional jet, and of course, the Airbus 320. I also have flight instructor, instrument, and multi-engine ratings. I attended Embry-Riddle Daytona Beach, graduated with a BS in aeronautical science. And then after graduation, I spent nearly three years teaching people how to fly because airlines require a minimum number of flight hours to get hired and that's a good way to build time and give back. Um, I also flew some night freight and small airplanes. In the year 2000, I was hired at Great Lakes Aviation where I was a first officer in an E120 Brasilia, that's a 30 seat turboprop. Um, it's pretty typical for pilots. You start out with small aircraft and work your way up, particularly back in the day. Nowadays, most likely you'll start out in a regional jet. Um, where was I? From there, I went to Atlantic Southeast, known as ASA. That was a Delta Connection carrier in Atlanta. They're no longer flying. At ASA, I flew the Brasilia and, of course, the 50C CRJ200 as a first officer. And then I upgraded to captain in 2006 on the ATR-72, which is a 66-seat turboprop aircraft. I flew that until it was tired and went to the CRJ-200, 700, and 900 as a captain. Those are just larger versions of the same aircraft, 50, 70, or 76 seats. In 2016, I was hired at Allegiant Air, and I'm currently a first officer on the Airbus 320, and the Airbus holds 186 people. The primary objective in my occupation is to safely get people where they need to be. We operate in a complex dynamic environment and one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world. I have to meet strict FAA medical standards and I endure a thorough FAA medical exam twice a year, including an EKG annually. Medical issues could end my career at any time, so it's important to stay healthy. I also endure aircraft simulator checks twice a year where we need to demonstrate high proficiency in normal operations, maneuvers, and handling emergency situations. A failure to demonstrate proficiency can also be career ending, so we're always studying and staying on top of our game. I'm proud to say that in 25 years of flying and over 12,000 flight hours, I've never had an accident or incident, knock on wood. I have safely and successfully dealt with many aircraft emergencies, both due to mechanical issues and passenger medical issues. I chose this occupation because I'd always been interested in flying. My favorite uncle growing up was a TWA pilot who began his career in the mid 60s in the golden days of airline flying. I always loved his stories and as a child I would hang out in his home office playing with his airplane models or reading his flight books. He took me flying in his small airplane and I was hooked. The knowledge and skills required to become an airline pilot include high attention to detail, 
the ability to operate in a dynamic, ever-changing environment, and the ability to quickly analyze complex situations and make correct decisions. Many airlines require a four-year degree. At others, it's not required, but strongly recommended. Very few airlines will hire a pilot with only a high school diploma. It doesn't matter what field your degree is in. In fact, many pilots intentionally choose a degree in something other than aviation as a fallback. In my opinion, ooh, my notes. <laughs> In my opinion, the best way to get into this profession is to obtain a degree from an accredited institution and then either concurrently or subsequently attend a, universe, a flight academy such as ATP flight schools where one can get their ratings quickly and efficiently. Four-year flighting universities like Embry-Riddle, public universities like the University of North Dakota or Auburn University are also options. Many state colleges and universities also have flight programs. The university flight option allows one-stop shopping to get your degree and your flight ratings, but they do tend to cost more. Many flight schools and universities offer internships with various airlines where you can learn what it's like to work there and make great contacts that'll help you get hired later. Most programs also offer flight instructing opportunities to graduates needing to build hours. Direct track programs have also become common where you graduate, instruct for a predetermined amount of time, and then transfer directly to a regional airline, such as Delta Connection, United Express, or American Eagle. Um, the American Eagle carriers like Envoy, PSA, and Piedmont actually have direct entry to American Airlines where pilots can flow directly without having to interview again, which can be a huge bonus to doing one of those programs. One of the unfortunate aspects of this career is that it is backloaded. What I mean by that is you pay up front to get your training and then when you get hired, you make very little for many years. This industry is the most heavily unionized in the world and union contracts tend to reward seniority. The most senior pilots make the big bucks and the newer pilots are told to pay their dues in hopes of making the big bucks someday. Pay is definitely a logarithmic curve upward, not a straight line. A typical career progression in this industry is flight instructor, and then first officer and then captain on a regional airline, and then on to a major airline as the first officer. Another unfortunate aspect of this industry is that every time you change companies, you have to start over again at the bottom. This also applies if your airline goes out of business. A typical first officer at a regional airline can expect to make approximately forty-five dollars to $55,000 a year. A regional airline captain can expect to make approximately eighty dollars to $100,000. A first officer at a major airline can expect to make $100,000 to $150,000 a year after the first year. And a captain can make as much as $400,000 a year at the top, although $150,000 to $250,000 is typical. Those top earners probably have 20 to 30 years in their company. Progression at the airlines is heavily dependent upon timing, the state of the economy, and a little bit of luck. Benefits typically include good health care coverage, 401k, and defined contribution retirement plans, and of course, travel privileges. Another plus of this career is that pilots are limited by the FAA in the amount of hours we can work, so we tend to get a lot of days off, and you definitely don't take your work home with you. With a little seniority, 15 days off a month is typical. We have a mandatory retirement age of 65 years old, which limits your time to progress. The industry has always been very cyclical, and unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we are heading into a down cycle. If someone wants to be an airline pilot, it's still a great time to get started, COVID-19 notwithstanding. Due to mandatory retirements, thousands of pilots will still be retiring in the next 10 to 15 years. Before the pandemic, the airlines were hurting for pilots, especially at the regional airlines. The pandemic and the economic downturn that follows will cause many pilots to get laid off and hiring to stop for several years, but eventually things will rebound. Analysts are predicting the industry will return to normal in the next three to five years, and demand for pilots will definitely return. Someone starting out in training today will most likely not be ready to fly for an airline until then anyhow. S despite its cyclical nature, I still enjoy the job and couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. The work to pay ratio is unmatched in any other industry, and the view is pretty good. Were you ready to have your photo shown? Oh yeah, you can go. Yeah, I didn't know if you were gonna do them while I was talking or yeah. 
just go, you can go ahead and do that and I'll tell everybody what they're okay. doing. All right, let me see. Um, share my screen really quick and we can see. So there's a picture of the cockpit of the Airbus 320. There's a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a picture of the plane I fly. Um, that one was coming in for landing in Punta Gorda, Florida. At Allegiant, we tend to fly to smaller airports and do direct service. We bypass most of the larger hubs. So it's kind of an interesting job. We're definitely different than any of the other airlines. You fly my favorite plane. <laughs> I love it. It's a great plane. It's probably the nicest I've ever flown. Yeah. You can see on the Airbus, there's a little joystick on the sides there, and that's how we actually fly the airplane for those who are used to seeing like a control yoke in the middle. And the Airbus is probably one of the more automated airplanes out there, although not quite as cool as the G5 we're going to hear about here in a little while. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Damn, fancy pants over here. G5. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Sydney. My pleasure. Um, stay tuned for some questions at the end. Um, and so now we're going to move on to our next panelist. Let me pull up this next bio. All right. So next we I'm have Peter sure. McDaniel. It's brief. I only wrote like a sentence. It's perfect. You'll, I'm sure, elaborate on it. So Peter is a pilot of heavy long range international business jets. He is an experienced captain and trainer of new jet pilots. His aviation background includes time as a flight instructor and cargo pilot. And his start in aviation was with the Marine Corps as an enlisted helicopter crew chief. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Peter. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Peter and uh, I do a very similar career to Sydney, but there is a uh, deviation, right? So we go, we both went through the same stuff with becoming pilots. We went to the same schooling, um, had the same costs associated with getting the career up and running. But after you're finished with your flight instruction and cargo flying, which by the way, cargo flying is super fun, uh, but pays nothing. Um, exactly. Um, then you have a choice to make. You can either join an airline and go off on Sydney's route, or you can go another direction and go off and fly business jets. Um, the airline flying is more of a uh, career path that's laid out over a longer uh, a period of time where business jets is just kind of on you. Um, you're, you can accelerate as fast as you want, or you can stay at the bottom for your entire career. Um, a lot of the advancement has to do with, uh, unfortunately, just your popularity. Um, so you, you'll start off as a co-pilot in a small jet, like a Learjet, and you'll be making maybe 40 grand a year. Um, if you're fun to hang out with and people enjoy your company and you're not bad at flying, you can very quickly find yourself in a heavy long range jet. Um, this is a pay more. And so people who are popular get better jobs faster. If you're kind of a jerk to fly with, you'll find yourself stuck in that same little cockpit for your entire career. Um, there is no pay advancement with um, seniority, there's no stepping to the next job as you get enough um, experience. It's just what you're willing to work yourself through um, and who you know. So uh, besides just basically, like everyone assumes you know how to fly. If you can't fly, well, you're not going anywhere in either job. But um, with private jets, it's about making connections with people um, making friends, hanging out with people when you're at the hotels, and just a lot of networking, um, joining clubs, stuff like that. Um, so I went through, um, I flew small Learjets, um, I, I flew uh, Citations, um, then I, I made a friend who uh, was in Gulf Streams, and he got me a job Unlike the airlines, the, the, the interview is not technical. It's a social interview. So it's literally out to dinner with some people. Um, I got into Gulf Streams, 
uh, made captain within about two years. Uh, I've been in Gulf Streams ever since. Um, once you're in and sort of settled into the position which uh, you enjoy um, or the highs you can reach, um, it's slightly different than airlining. Um, Sydney, I wrote it down, has 12,000 hours, which is to me just unfathomable amount of time in the air. Um, I'm an experienced captain who's been doing this a long time. I have 4,000 hours of total time. Um, so a typical flight for me would be um, take off out of Los Angeles or New York, wherever, uh, fly over to wherever you're going, be it Paris, Lebanon, some weird little place in Africa where there's an oil well or a gold mine. And then you just sit there for a week or two and do whatever you're gonna do. Um, when the people are ready to come back, they get back in the plane, you fly them back to where they're from and that's your two weeks of work. You've flown two legs, once there, once back. Um, so it's uh, a lot less intense while you're at work. Um, then the other side of it is when you're actually doing the flight, we have no support. Um, you're given a trip sheet, which is a two page piece of paper saying who the passengers are, where they're going, when they're coming back, um, and what kind of catering they want, which can be insane, um, and what their needs are. And that's all, you, and you get handed an airplane, and that's, that's the last interaction you have from the company. Um, so you're in charge of your international trip planning, you're in charge of contacting other um, other countries for overflight permits, you're in charge of your own purchasing your own fuel, getting the best deals on your own fuel, setting up your accommodations. Um, so there's a, a lot of autonomy uh, involved in it. Um, we don't go through airline terminals. Um, I don't spend any time in O'Hare or you know, LaGuardia where it's small airfields with no security. Uh, you just drive your car up to the plane and get into it. It's, Kind of like being a glorified limousine driver. Um, let's see what else I was going to say. Uh, so getting into this career for both uh, airline like Sydney's in or business jets like I'm in, um, the step that's most important is building those hours in the beginning. Like you just, you need to have a lot of hours. Uh, what is it, Sydney's at 1500 now? Your first job? Yeah, it's 1500 and then there's exceptions for military and certain um, flight school programs yeah. that can get you down, I think, 800. So to get in the uh, either one of 1500 now for the airlines. 18? Oops, I'm, I don't know if you can you hear me. Yeah. yeah, it's 1500 hours for the ATP unrestricted. And then I think military experience gets you down to 1000. And a structured program like an Embry Riddle or an ATP would get you down to 800, I believe. So, in, any one of those numbers are still giant numbers. Um, if, you, if you're doing flight instruction and you're just working 12 hours a day, you're going to get eight hours a day of flying. And that's an unreasonable amount of time to expect. So, the problem with both the jobs is just getting those first jobs and billing that time. So, um, when I finished up flight school, I went into flight instruction, which is the first job you can get with really low hours. So you'll do that for a couple of years. Um, after that, you'll get into either traffic watch or um, cargo flying. Again, both of which are, you know, about minimum wage jobs. And that takes most people about five years to make it through that time. Um, then once you get that license, it's called the ATP, Air, uh, Airline Transport Pilots. Uh, license, that's when you can start applying to flying jets. Um, so the difficult part of this career is the huge money load up front um, and then getting those, and then after putting all that money out, not getting paid for another five years afterwards. So I think my, my training was somewhere around $200,000 uh, in the beginning, and then another five years of not making money after that. Um, in business jets though, uh, we have the same average high. So uh, an experienced captain can make on average 150 to $200,000 a year uh, with the same outliers. But you have the couple of people who are making $400,000 a year. Um, 
in business jets, you can get to those numbers a lot faster. Um, it doesn't take you 20 years to arrive there. Um, I was probably, I was at 150 within, well, I don't know, five years after I started flying jets. Um, the, however, unlike an airline, there's no union. So they'll lay you off at a drop of a hat with no notice whatsoever. Um, but then unlike an airline, you don't have to start at the, at the bottom again. You have that experience flying that particular plane. So you can just jump into another plane that the same or you know greater or maybe a little bit less pay. Um, I think that's about the extent of the differences. Um, one of the big things you do, and all three of us have said the same thing, you have to be willing to travel. Uh, this is not a job for someone who likes to be at home and I hate to say it, but have friends and family. Like you just, you're just gone for um, business jets. You'd be gone for up to a month at a time. Maybe you'd be home for a month, then maybe you'd be home for a day and you'll go back out again. So you just need to be willing to travel. You need to be willing, well, unlike airlines with business jets, you need to be willing to move too. Um, if the next great job is in a different city than you live in, they're not interested in you commuting. You need to live where the job is. Um, so uh, again, like, like Sydney said, the, the pay to work ratio is unbelievable. It's such an easy job once you're good at it. It's really hard to get into, but once you're in, it's the most amount of pay for the least amount of work, as long as you don't mind never being home. So, I think that, uh, that about covers mine. Are you ready for your photos? Oh, I forgot about the photos. Okay, so the, I'll do the first one, Brie. Um, okay. This is just a little video I made. Uh, this is a couple of years ago. I was in uh, Hawaii and uh, I walked around the plane and did a little uh, time lapse of, of the plane. So this is the plane I fly. <laughs> that um, the amount of people we fly is significantly less uh, that is one of the bigger private jets uh, it has 12 seats and nobody ever fills the seats it's a you walk into the plane and uh, instead of making a left to the cockpit if you make a right there's a, a kitchen there uh, behind the kitchen is a living room with a couple of uh, big recliners and a couch behind that is a bedroom uh, which can convert into seating uh, and then behind that will be uh, a bathroom. So the, the planes are much smaller. Um, they certainly, so you're dealing with like two people. Those two people might be billionaires, but um, like two to four people is your average. So that's that. And then Bree, you got those photos. I put, I pulled up a couple of photos off my phone of just the interior of the planes and show what we're doing. Uh, this is Tokyo. We're coming for landing there. Um, oh, this is the simulator. So all pilots. Oh no. There you go. So sorry. They're kind of jumping. All right. All right. We'll go ahead. Uh, that's Dylan. That's uh, my co-pilot, the guy I usually fly with, and uh, we were just hanging out in the back of the plane, waiting for the passengers to show up. So that's that is the first room. That's the sort of living room area of the plane. No big deal. Uh, the next thing, Brie? <laughs> uh, that was in, I don't remember where, some amazing tropical island. Uh, we had been dropped off there for a week and uh, we rented a sailboat, went sailing around, uh, just explored the island, got drunk every night, had great meals. Oh, you're on pre the whole time, so all this stuff's paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, so your, your take-home salary is just the same no matter what. What you do on the road is on you, well, on them. Um, so these are the simulators, they're, they're level D simulators. You have to do this twice a year. They always call it slapping your license on the dashboard because if you fail it, they'll take your license away and you have to retrain. So it's a stressful event you do twice a year uh, where you go in, you climb into these boxes and they close the doors on them and you go through emergency procedures, normal procedures, and then just make sure that you haven't forgotten how to fly the thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff to memorize um, doing this stuff. There's a lot of things that you, 
you know that you just never use. Um, and so they keep those skills sharp in those simulators. And is there any more pictures? Was that all I sent you? Oh, that's, uh, and we don't wear a uniform a lot of times. It depends on who the client is, but you know, we just wear a suit or you know, occasionally a uniform. So that is in, oh, that was in, oh, that, that's in China uh, about two months ago. Uh, there was a bunch of the TikTok people were uh, running away from the United States as the COVID thing exploded. So we dropped them off in China, uh, like in China, uh, G5. Yep, that's about it. Can I just say something real quick? Yeah. It sounds so pretentious when airline people talk. We're not pretentious people. We just happen. It is our livelihood. It's our job. Not that you're pretentious, Peter, but I say it too. I'm like, oh, I went to Paris for lunch the other day. You know, it's it's kind of a unique thing where it, so, it is jet setting. I mean, especially Peter. Sydney knows too, though. You get called to go somewhere and you get to go for 24 hours and so there is that like very, very unique benefit to it. Um, but it's just funny because it's like, oh, I was here. I, my friends are always like, oh, you were just in, oh, you just hop over to Thailand for two weeks? Yeah, because it's free to fly there or next to free. So again, the benefits are pretty good as you can see, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think we take it for granted. Like you log on Facebook, you're like, oh, one friend's in Tokyo, one friend's in Paris. <laughs> we definitely take it for granted. Yeah, uh, it's like not a normal. do not get the free flight benefit. We do not, we are not part of that. Um, that's just, that's an airline only thing. But on the flip side though, we, the airlines will stay in modestly priced hotels and eat at modestly priced restaurants where we'll stay in whatever the nicest hotel in, in the town we're in is in and usually eat at the nicer restaurants. So there's sort of back and forth on whatever you're into. And that's another thing I remembered. So you said they put you up and they, or you choose your accommodations, but they pay for everything. And, and with Sydney and I, they pay for our hotels on our, mm -hmm. and provide transportation to and from hotels for us on the airline side of things. Okay. And then our PM technically that tax free is what we get for our food and drink and everything. That's kind of what it goes towards, but you don't have I'm to. I'm forgetting, I've been doing this long enough, I'm forgetting all these reasons why I chose private jets. In an airliner, you don't get a rental car. So when we show up in, in you know, Delhi, you get a rental car so you can go drive around and see it. The airline people are, I don't even know how you guys get around, but it's not a rental car. A rental car that we pay for. <laughs> We get our own rental car. <laughs> but we're, we're at, when you have a layover that's over 16 hours um, for our airline, we're, we are required to be in the downtown area of wherever we are. So if it's New York, we're in downtown New York or whatever big city it is, you're required at 16 hours over to be where there is something you can do. So there, that's all contractual and it depends on each airline, but yeah. That's another, uh, that's another big difference is you guys have somewhat of a schedule, right? You, they, you kind of know in advance where we have no schedule. Um, so you're just, you just have your phone with you. Um, the longest I've been not called for is I think a month and a half. Um, just the phone just didn't ring. You can keep getting paid irregardless. Um, but then when the phone rings, you better be available. And then you're gone for God knows how. So you miss a lot of birthdays. You miss a lot of big events. You can't, um, planning trips, like weekend trips with your friends is not something you can do. Um, I call it getting turned up on a Tuesday. Because yeah. <laughs> our weekends are not there, we, like normal weekends. So in the airline side, the seniority, that like the low end seniority, you can't really hold weekends off in the beginning. So if you want to go out, Hopefully your friends are free on a Tuesday at like 2 p.m. <laughs> so we yeah, get turned exactly. on Tuesdays. If I could throw no something notice. Um, my airline is a little bit unique, uh, different than what Peter or Nicole have. At Allegiant, we only do day trips. So you live in your base and you're home every night. And we're basically the only airline that does this. Yeah. Um, however, <laughs> if you don't live in the base, that makes it a little more difficult because you have to have a place to live there. Crash uh, 
Right. Yeah. Crash pad is what we call it. There's a whole nother discussion. Oh God. Yep. I've done that in LA. Got to love El Segundo. Yeah. <laughs> but no, um, I do what we, we have a small, what we call it as a virtual base. Um, because we're a vacation airline and we have seasonal operations, we need people in the winter in Florida. We need people on the West coast in the summer. So we have a small cadre of pilots, which is what I do. And they move us around. So I will bid a base every month. And then once I'm in that base, they put me up in a hotel, so I don't need to get a place to live there. And I do get a rental car and I do get continuous per diem. So it's actually kind of a good deal, but everything we do is domestic. So if I want to go to Paris, I go on vacation. Yeah. Um, but we are a little bit different than most airlines. Like kind of what, what Peter was saying about, you know, you're never home. You, you can't have a dog, you can't have friends. It's a little bit different with my airline. It's kind of a good option for people who don't want that forever gone lifestyle. On the other hand, because I do the virtual base, I tend to work two weeks on, two weeks off. The other side of that coin is when I'm home for a long time, my spouse is like, when are you leaving? <laughs> There's a lot of downtime and it's kind of unique to be in this industry when you have that situation of, hey, you know, I have a part-time spouse. <laughs> There's a, uh... Yeah, just, that's the same with private jets. You're a part-time spouse, and they get used to you not being there. And when you're around too much, like, don't you have a job? Uh, but uh, Sydney was saying this. Right now. <laughs> private jets are cyclical as well. Um, it, it seems to go like 10-year cycles. Every 10 years, it's just the industry collapses. Everyone loses their job. No one makes any money. It's just misery. And then, you know, a couple of years later, it starts coming back again, and, you know, you're back to living your jet-setting lifestyle, having a great time, making great money. Yep. And I was going to say on that note where Sydney does one day trips because my flight attendant schedule is similar to the pilot schedule as well on the American side. Um, though they are regulated in your hours, Sydney, and we're not as regulated in those hours. But the, the uh, tip for us at American and Delta United, all the major um, international airlines in America, they, um, we fly either one, two, three, or four day trips. And some five, if it's like international, they'll do a five day trip. Um, and what that means is we're gone for that time and then we can be home. So you have flexibility over your schedule to choose which you want and it's by seniority. So like Sydney right now has comes home every night. That's a pretty senior thing if you live in base in my industry um, because there's a lot of moms. There are a lot of moms who wanna come home at night and things like that for their kids. And so those one days tend to go senior. But in a different base, it might not be like that. So it's just very fluid and flexible. And um, yeah, so it's interesting to see your guys' like jet setting life or like Peter's and then Sydney can come home every night and me. It's about, I like about three day trips, four days home, three days, four days. Or I'll just do like Sydney does, two weeks, two weeks, knock it out. Or you, it depends on the month. Depends on how you're feeling. <laughs> so. Do you want us to keep rambling or you got questions for us? No, so I have some questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. I actually really enjoyed that last bit of the interaction between you guys so you can really highlight the differences because you all three come from very different backgrounds. Even though it's all aviation, it's very different and diverse and different lifestyles and schedules. So that was amazing. Thank you guys. Um, we do, we did have a comment. I just want to note that first, um, the pictures that you guys all shared were very much enjoyed. They, they did like those. Um, and then our question. So what is one of the challenges in your career journey or in your current position or both and either anybody can start? Um, Go ahead. The, the biggest challenge is is the barrier of entry um, coming up coming up with the amount of money that you have to come up with to get into it and then after you pay that out just the feeling of the huge wall of the barrier of entry to get into it um, I, I guess that I mean, people will give you loans for it and I just I just say that you know don't worry once you get past the wall that barrier of entry it pays off and for mine, actually, for flight attending nowadays, um, I would say, so they did a, 
little article on it, a couple articles, that it's harder to be a flight attendant than it is to get into Harvard now by the numbers. So people are, it's such a good job and it's, it's unlike, and the pilots make way more than we do, but for what I do and I get to leave it at the end of the day and it like doesn't even affect me and I don't have to worry about the safety in terms of like flying the plane, I just worry about the passenger aspect. Um, I make way too much money as well for just what I do. <laughs> and so, but that is a hard thing to get your foot in the door is um, challenging. I've had some friends apply that I thought were shoe ins, but I didn't realize the sheer amount of people applying right now. And um, I mean, pre pandemic, but once you get in, it's great. And then the other challenge again for is that it seems like all three of us are very independent people. So we're speaking on, you know, oh, we like doing this and we like being by ourselves and we like going and seeing places and travel is great and it opens your mind and all that. But again, it's only recently with these newer hires for me that are younger than me. Um, I'm in my thir mid thirties, so younger, like twenties, 20 to 29, they're used to being in college. They're used to friends. They're used to that staying home. Some of them want family. Some of them want a dog. And those things are very difficult. No dogs. If you like dogs, you're done. Have a bunny. Have a bunny. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. And then to be honest, um, creating a bot, like my boyfriend is great. And we've been four and a half years of on and off long distance where, and then I finally moved here. It's great. But I met him through friends that I had before the job because you you could meet someone on the plane if you're interested in a relationship or you might not for years, you know? So it's like, it's very hard to make a connection. And once you do make a connection, whether it be romantic or friends, it took a while for my friends to understand what my job was and be not be mad at me, to be honest. And my family, they get hurt because you can't be at everything if anything at all especially the first few years I'm nine years I'm going into my ninth year so I have that flexibility and seniority so now I can be at weddings and birthdays and things like that but it takes a while and it hurts people's feelings a lot um, at the beginning and they think you're intentionally not going to things and you don't love them and you're like you know most people work a Monday through Friday job and you're not, I, I only have Tuesdays off and Wednesdays. So uh, can you visit on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? So it's really imperative if you are somebody who likes those connections to just understand what you're getting into at the, at, at the beginning and kind of explain it to, to those people and try to get them to work with you on it. Eventually people come around, but it does shake out some of the people that aren't gonna be able to deal with it as friends and more. Yeah, building on what Peter and Nicole said, definitely the whole thing about, like, your non-aviation friends do not understand what we do. They don't know what it's like to be gone. And I've worked for conventional airlines where you are gone four or five days, and then you're home three days, and your friends are like, hey, we're having a grill out, we're having a party, and you're like, yeah, I'm working, I can't be there. Um, and of course, it's hard to have a kid and a dog and all that kind of stuff when you work for that kind of an airline. I'm pretty lucky to work for an airline that's not like that, but it's unique. But you've also um, paid your dues to get there. <laughs> my spouse is, used to be a flight attendant. There's a lot to be said for marrying somebody in the industry too, but again, yeah. that's another discussion. That's Probably my biggest challenge, um, Peter mentioned the, the barriers to entry of getting into the industry and, and keeping your job. But the thing about the airlines, unlike the corporate world, is again, every time you leave, you have to start over. This is my fourth airline. So it's all really about timing. Like for me, like I started right before 9-11. So then that killed it for two or three years. And then we had the recession, 2008 housing crisis, oil prices spiked, they raised the retirement age from 60 to 65. So then nobody left for five years and there was no upwards progression. Now we've got the COVID. I mean, I've literally been doing this for 20 years. And I've only worked for a major airline for three and a half years now. Meanwhile, people who got into it in 2010 have gone straight to a major airline. They spent two years at a regional airline and moved on. 
Um, I've also got people who are my captain now who I trained at my previous airline because they advanced faster than me because they took a chance and left and I stayed and enjoyed my seniority longer. So it's really all just about being at the right place at the right time and then hoping that you hold on to the job. Like Nicole said, an awful lot of us are going to get furloughed come October the 1st if something doesn't change. So fingers crossed that people start buying plane tickets again. So, I mean, it's a great industry when you're in it, but it's really kind of crazy. However, those of us who do it, we're completely hooked. I could not imagine going back to an office job, and I've done office jobs. And I mean, the nice thing about this is something different every single day. And, you know, sometimes you've got a great crew and you go to work with your best friends every week. Sometimes your spouse will bid your trip, and that's fun too. Other times you're like, when can this trip end and I can divorce this guy? <laughs> so it's all it's never a dull moment in aviation that's probably one of the best things about it yeah. exactly awesome well we are out of time now you guys i just want to thank you all three of you for sharing all of your experiences you can tell you are all people people there was a lot of interaction and a lot of fun conversations um so thank you for keeping it alive in here and um, thank you to all of our participants that are here viewing. And I uh, hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Yeah, thanks, Brie. It was fun. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Absolutely. Take, Take care, care. Bye, people. <laughs> Bye.